So good morning. We finally made it to the last week. Uh, we've all hung in there and, and survived and done fairly well, I think. Um, what I want to do today is slightly different from what's on the calendar. And it's part in part prompted by some questions some of you have been asking. I want to spend a little more time today talking about uh, the different models of light that we have. We've so last semester we talked about light as being made of phot photons, little particles that had energy and momentum. And this semester we're talking about light as waves electromagnetic waves, they can be sinusoidally oscillating, uh, E and B, E cross B gives you the direction that the wave is, is, is moving, is propagating. And so we actually have two different models of light. And what I'd like to do is talk about how we reconcile that because as physicists, we are disturbed when we have two completely different models of something and we we'd like to to unify them into one model. So that's the agenda for today and to start out with we have to we have to work a little bit more with uh, sinusoidal electromagnetic radiation. So today I want to talk about light and a little more on sinusoidal radiation and then light is light is a wave versus light is a particle. And then on Thursday, what I want to do is basically a review um, of many, many, many things we've done this semester in the context of thinking about sparks, which is just kind of a cool phenomenon. We've seen that from Maxwell's equations, we were able to, to figure out that um, electric, a time-varying electric field, if it varies the right way, can generate a time-varying magnetic field, which generates a time-varying electric field, and these things propagate through space at the speed of light, um, and that this can be initiated by accelerating a charged particle, that uh, an accelerated charged particle is the, the source, if you like, of this electromagnetic wave that propagates through space. So if we have a proton that's accelerated to the left, as in this, um, is in this diagram here. The question is, at what location um, will we, if you put a detector at each of these locations labeled A, B, C, D, E, at which location will you not detect electromagnetic radiation from that accelerated charge, or will you in fact detect it at all locations. So the majority of you said that location E is the location at which we would not detect radiation. And that is absolutely correct. So let's see why. So even if you don't remember the actual the full equation uh, for electromagnetic radiation, the, the radiative, the the radiative electric field from an accelerated charge, remember it was one over four pi epsilon zero proportional to the charge. There was a C squared R, and then there was this A perpendicular in the numerator. And that's that's the key for deciding whether, you know, what the, the magnitude of E is gonna be at the, those locations. So location A, for example, Here's our vector r, and in fact, this is the this is the acceleration. The acceleration is perpendicular to a, so a is of course the location where we will see the most the most intense electromagnetic radiation. And in fact, oops, there's a minus sign in this equation, isn't there? And so because of this minus sign, we know that the what the minus sign tells us, we know that the direction of the re E in the radiative field is going to be opposite to the direction of A perpendicular since Q is a positive number. This is a proton. 
And so in fact, the electric field we detect at, at A is gonna be in that direction. And at some other location like location C, um, what's the component of A perpendicular to C? To, to R at, at C, um, well, the component of A uh, perpendicular to R is gonna be, gonna be that, right? So A perpendicular is still not zero, and so we will indeed see some electric field at C, it's, it's going to be smaller, though, in that direction. But when we get to E, <clears throat> there actually is no component of A. The component of A perpendicular to, to R, in the case of A, is actually zero. And so in line with the acceleration, we don't see any radiation at all. So in fact, it's, it's, it's E. We talked about generating sinusoidal electromagnetic waves by putting a, an electron or a proton on a spring and letting it oscillate up and down. And in fact, this is, this is a really, really common kind of electromagnetic radiation. Most of the radiation we see or we, preserve, we perceive, we detect with our detectors is in fact sinusoidal radiation. And, <clears throat> Um, it's easy to imagine electrons sort of oscillating back and forth with the spring being their, their bond to the nucleus in an atom. Um, and remember that sinusoidal radiation and by the way, radiation and radioactivity are not the same thing. Um, so we talk about this as electromagnetic radiation. Uh, radiation just means it's radiating out from somewhere, really. Um, this has nothing at all to do with radioactivity, which is little charged particles or, or pieces of atoms flying apart. Um, so... Uh, so a sinusoidal wave, as you all know, uh, looks kind of like this. And, and if we look at, if we plot the, say the Y component of the electric field in the wave as a function of position. So location in space, we'd see something like that, right? And, this, remember that this distance is called the amplitude. So the maximum value of E is the amplitude. And this distance between one peak and the next peak or one trough and the next trough is called the wavelength. And we use the Greek symbol, lowercase lambda, for wavelength. But this is varying in both. So this is the spatial part, spatial variation. But the electric field also, and the magnetic field, of course, also vary in time. So if you stand at one location and just watch use a detector, what you're going to see is a variation of uh, electric field as a function of time as well. So, so this is the time temporal variation. And so if we made a graph of what we detected, we might see something like that. And um, this is still the amplitude. But now the distance between these two peaks or troughs, 
has units of time. And so this is the, the period for which we use capital T. And remember that there's some relationships between wavelength and period and speed of propagation. So remember that we have frequency, which is one over the period. It has units of inverse seconds, so basically cycles per second. Um, the units are, of that is hertz. Um, and of course, the, the angular frequency is 2 pi over the period. The speed of a peak, V, is going to be, well, it travels one wavelength in one period. So it's just going to be lambda over time. So frequency is going to be uh, the speed over the wavelength or speed of light over the wavelength, right? <clears throat> there are lots of, uh, we have names, different names for electromagnetic radiation depending on its frequency or its wavelength. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, right? because since they're related by this frequency is speed of light over the wavelength. So, um, so radiation here that has a very short wavelength, like 10 to the minus 14 meters, we're up here in gamma rays, um, has, a, has a high frequency. And this is, um, whereas radiation, that's um, that's got a a long wavelength on the order of 100 meters or something like that uh, has a lower frequency. So in order to talk about uh, before when we talked about um, about light as photons, we talked about the energy of a photon, right? So we need to know how, we need to understand what the energy, how to get calculate the energy in an electromagnetic wave. Um, so, um, So energy in an electromagnetic wave. <clears throat> so let's think about a wave that's coming, that's, uh, think about our little pulse, our favorite pulse that has electric field. It doesn't even have to be a sinusoidal wave at the moment. <clears throat> electric field up and magnetic field out of the page and therefore it's traveling that way at speed c and let's think about what happens when it gets to a proton that's just hanging on a spring here well it's clear there's going to be a force on this positive charge because there's an electric field, right? And so um, if the thing is initially at rest, so initially at rest, we can just use the momentum principle and we can say the change of momentum for this charge, the system is the charge the change of momentum of the charge in the plus y direction is the final momentum minus zero because it was at rest initially. And that's gonna be F net y delta t. But we know what that is. That's just the charge of the 
the object times the electric field in the radiation times delta T. Well, what is delta T? How, it's how long this force acts on the particle, right? So let's say our, uh, our pulse here has a width D and it's traveling at speed C, then the time that it acts on the, on the charge is just going to be D over C, the time. <clears throat> and, uh, and now this, this ball has kinetic energy too. So the change in the kinetic energy of this charge is just this final kinetic energy minus zero. So it's the momentum squared over twice its mass. And that's going to be equal to uh, QED over C squared times 1 over 2M. So, so basically what we end up with here is we look like we've got an, we've got an E squared. So it looks like kinetic energy, the energy that it that it's picking up is proportional to the square of the the amplitude, the magnitude of the the electric field. So energy. Here, let me write it down here. Actually, um, so energy in an electromagnetic wave is proportional to the the square of the the amplitude the magnitude of the electric field and we can it actually so quantitatively what it turns out to be is that we can calculate the energy in a volume of electromagnetic radiation. So here's our wave passing through space and in this volume of space, we can get the energy. And so energy per unit volume. So this is um, joules per square meter, joules per cubic meter. Turns out to be, and we won't go through the derivation here, but epsilon zero, one over a half epsilon zero E squared plus a half mu zero B squared, where this is the, the magnitudes of the electric and magnetic fields. And in radiation, we know that the magnitude of the electric field is the speed of light times the magnitude of the magnetic field. So, um, so energy per unit volume is just going to be uh, a half epsilon zero e squared plus a half mu zero times e over c squared. And we actually end up with epsilon zero e squared. <clears throat> So that's, and so the, the bigger the, the electric field, the more energy the wave has in this model. So there's also momentum in electromagnetic radiation, and we can actually, so we, we talked about photons having momentum, and momentum being conserved in processes where photons were created or destroyed or something, absorbed or something. So we have to have momentum in electromagnetic radiation too. And so let's go back to our interaction with our hanging charge here. So here's our wave coming in with E, B, and traveling in that direction at speed C. And here's our charge on a spring. And so when the wave gets to the 
the charge, it exerts an upward force. In this case, we're taking a positive charge just to make it easy to think about. And so the there's a change in momentum of the charge upward. And of course, um, if it was a negative charge, so over here we have a negative charge and here's our here's our pulse um, then then the the force would be downward and so there'd be a a change of change of momentum downward But that's not actually all that's going on. That's the biggest force, right? The electric force is certainly a big force, but there is a magnetic field there too. And so if we think about our charge, let's go back to the positive charge. So here's our, here's our positive charge that now has a, a speed upward. Well, we've got a magnetic field out of the page. And so there's going to be a magnetic force, isn't there? So if we point our fingers, fingers up um, in the direction of the magnetic force of, of the velocity, and then we, we fold our fingers out of the page toward B, you know, our thumb sticks out in the direction. This is magnetic force. So so in fact, we've got a magnetic force in the direction that the, that the radiation was traveling. Well, what happens if it's an electron? Does this just cancel it out? If, this, if we had radiation incident on a neutral atom, we're interacting with both the electron and the, the proton. So let's, let's see what would happen if we had the electron here. So here's our negative charge. It has a velocity downward. We have a magnetic field out of the page. So V cross B is to the left, but then we have to multiply by this minus this negative number. That's the sign of the charge. And so in fact, we also get a magnetic force to the right. And so there's a net, a net magnetic force in the direction of propagation of the so there's a net force in the direction of propagation of the radiation. <clears throat> so this, if this, think of this as a neutral atom that's hit by this radiation, the, the proton gets a kick up, the electron gets a kick down, but they both get a kick going in the direction of propagation and it gains momentum. And this is actually, um, so momentum is transferred to the particle and this is actually called radiation pressure when we talk about it in this classical model. And is it good for anything? Well, in fact, you probably, if you're interested in in uh, space travel at all, you've actually you've probably read about solar sails, where a spacecraft gets out away from the Earth and then opens up really, really, really large reflective sails, and just light coming from a star, from the sun exerts a small. Now, this this magnetic forces are small, right? It exerts a small, but finite magnetic force on this and all the atoms in this big sail and it keeps doing it it never stops so slowly slowly this craft can pick up speed and actually sail through the uh, the solar system or maybe even the galaxy just by navigating with with solar sails so electromagnetic waves can carry both um, energy and momentum, but, but so could photons. So 
So what's the evidence that electromagnetic radiation really is wave-like? Um, so we're going to look, we're going to look at, at, at two things here. We're going to go, we're going to look at evidence for electromagnetic radiation as wave-like. And then after that, we're going to look at the evidence for it being particle-like and then see what we can do to put this together. <clears throat> And one of the most important pieces of evidence for wave-like character of electromagnetic radiation just comes from the superposition principle. Um, so if we shine two electromagnetic waves on something, then the electric field at the point where they both hit it should be the sum of the electric fields in both of those waves, right? So that's not a big deal. And if there's, if it's a sinusoidal electromagnetic wave, then we should, we should, we could see that vary, right? And this is called, um, when we're talking about waves, uh, this has the technical name of interference. And it can be can be positive or negative. So it can, I mean, it it can it can add up to something bigger or something smaller, just depending. So let's see uh, how this might play out. So of course we have a V Python uh, illustration of this. So what is this? Well, we have two electromagnetic waves and we're, we're really only showing the, uh, at the we, here are the electric and magnetic fields. I'll just turn off the display of the magnetic fields because um, it's actually sort of visually distracting. And so what's going on? Well, if we take a top view here, um, we can see that these waves are coming from two different sources here on the left. And they're coming together at a point here. And what's this this line? This line is 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 a screen, okay? It's just like a movie projection screen or something, all right? Or could be the wall. Um, and so at that point, when those two waves come together, the net electric field should be the sum of the electric fields in both of these these waves, right? Just superposition. And that's what that green arrow there is showing. It's showing the electric field at the location where both of those waves come together on the screen. And you can see that it happens in this situation that the waves are coming together. When the waves come together, they're either both a peak or they're both a trough. They're, they're what we call in phase, okay, in the same phase. And what that means is that they're both at a maximum at the same instant at that location, it, okay? So the, it happens that in this particular situation, we've arranged it geometrically, so the waves end up in phase. And the result is that, I mean, when, when they're both zero, they're both zero, but when they're both maximum, the net electric field is really big. It's twice as big as the electric field in, uh, in either wave. And that's called constructive interference. Okay, but it doesn't have to work that way. So if we pick a different location, so again, we've got this, um, we've got this, uh, these two sources hitting a screen, but we just picked a different location on the screen because these two sources are radiating in many directions and we're just looking at, we're just choosing one particular direction at a time. So this particular location that we picked on the screen, <clears throat> the waves end up being completely out of phase. So the one that's represented in red is a max when the one that's represented in orange is a min. 
And the result is that at all times, they cancel out in this one location here, just due to superposition, and it adds up to zero. And that's called destructive interference. And it, uh, that's just a fancy name for superposition adding up to zero. And of course, you can have both simultaneously. So uh, here's Here's our situation with these two sources. And now we're looking at light coming to the lower location where the waves happen to be in phase and it's adding up to a, uh, a large number. That's the constructive interference. But at the, the other location up here, the waves end up completely out of phase and they add up to zero. So, if electromagnetic radiation is indeed this kind of sinusoidal wave thing, we ought to be able to see this. We ought to be able to do an experiment to actually see if this really happens. And in fact, we can. So, <clears throat> So what's the experiment we're gonna do? Well, what we're gonna do is, is take, um, take a laser. And laser light has the interesting property that when, when waves come out of the laser, they are, they're always in phase, okay? It's, um, and, what we're going to do is shine it on a piece of something that's mostly opaque, but it has two slits in it. So there's a slit and there's a slit, they're openings. And the light, the laser light will go through these slits. And when, when it gets through, it's basically we have two beams of light coming through that are in phase, okay? So it's called a two-slit experiment. And then we're going to put a screen over here or shine it on the wall and see what we get. Now, this wave model predicts that that we should, there should be spots on the wall where we get really, really bright spots due to constructive interference. So we get some spots where that are, that are really, really bright. And then we get some spots where there's nothing. And so there'd be some bright spots and some dark spots. Um, um, so this would be constructive interference and right here would be destructive. And given the wavelength of the radiation and, and, um, and stuff like that, you, you can actually calculate exactly what the pattern you'd expect. So what do we actually see? Well, this isn't a great image, but it's one I could find in, in Wikimedia. And so this is um, light from a green laser that's passing through two slits that are uh, both 0.4 millimeters wide and they're 0.1 millimeter apart. Okay, so the width of a slit is 0.4 millimeters and the, the distance between them is a tenth of a millimeter. <clears throat> and what we see, in fact, is exactly this pattern of spots. Now there's, um, it's a slightly complicated pattern of spots, but there's places like, like, um, like here, where there's absolutely nothing. And there are places here that are, that are really bright. Whereas if we had particles going through there, they'd probably, we'd expect them to just sort of spatter around or pile up at, you know, locations right outside the slit. We would not expect to see this kind of interference pattern. So this really, 
really suggests that tells us that light absolutely does have a wave-like property. Okay, that light light must be um, light must be a wave. <clears throat> So what about evidence for the, the particle view of light? So, so we have evidence for waves. What about evidence for particles? And one of the key pieces of evidence is called the photoelectric effect. Um, and this is another of, in 1905, Einstein wrote a number of really key papers that sort of defined the direction of 20th century physics for many, many, many decades. And this was one of them, the, the paper on the photoelectric effect. So what's the photoelectric effect? Well, it's actually pretty simple. You have a piece of metal here and we know that metal has a bunch of mobile electrons, free electrons bound inside the metal, but free to move throughout the metal. And what is the photoelectric effect? It, what happens is if you shine light on a metal, <clears throat> under some circumstances, you actually can knock out an electron. Um, and if you think about light as, as a wave, you make one set of predictions about how this is going to work. And if you think about it as a particle, you make a different set of predictions about how this is going to work. So let's think about, uh, let's Think about the wave model of light for a minute. So we need to get enough energy to knock out an electron. Electrons are, are bound. Um, so the electrons are bound into the metal. You have to put in, you have to put in energy. And so the binding energy, you have to put in enough to overcome the binding energy. And that's on the order of a few EV. It's called technically, for some reason, the work function of the metal. I have no idea why it's called that, but what it means is the amount of energy you have to put in to, to, un, to overcome the, to get out of that potential energy well and, and unbind an electron. <clears throat> okay. So let's think about what these models would predict. So, um, so shining light on the surface of a metal can knock an electron out of a metal. So what would the wave model of light predict? Remember that in this model, we found that the energy density is proportional just to the square of the electric field. And this is called the, the intensity. In intensity of the beam, brightness, if you like. Um, um, so what would this model predict? Would it predict that it does, the frequency of the light doesn't matter as long as you just have enough intensity? Or does it predict that you actually would need um, to have some particular frequency in order to knock out an electron. Now we're asking about predictions of the model here. So the energy is just, just proportional to E squared. Okay, well that's a pretty interesting answer and I don't understand your reasoning. So you're going to need to explain it to me.
Um, so more of you said that a particular frequency is necessary uh, than that any frequency should work. And I don't see how this model predicts that. So, so I need you to explain your reasoning. It seems to me that back up here, we found that the energy in a light beam actually just depended on the, the square of the electric field, which is basically the brightness. So uh, we need energy, put in energy to knock out an electron. The more energy you put in, the more likely you are you, 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 can, you can get up to a point where you, where you can knock out an electron, right? So, so it seems to me that this model predicts that, that any frequency should work. You just need a bright enough beam. So would somebody who said two like to explain how you're thinking about it? <clears throat> Okay, but so if you're thinking about atoms ex accepting certain quanta of energy, you're not thinking about the wave model, however. And that's actually the distinction we're trying to make. So, okay, so you, you blew it off. Um, so what, what this model predicts is that is if energy is proportional to intensity, as long as you have an intense enough beam of light, you should be able to knock out an electron. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, so you were thinking of an indirect mechanism where the electron is actually just vibrating more and might collide with something else and get knocked out. Whereas, and maybe I didn't make it clear that the idea is that we're just talking about adding enough energy. Remember when you did orbits, okay? So you had a, a spacecraft orbiting a planet and you had, and we, you experimented with giving it enough energy by increasing its speed until it actually escaped, right? So it actually had enough energy to go off and never come back. Um, and that's basically what we're talking about, escape here. And so, um, so the, the wave model basically ends up predicting something like this, that um, to knock off an, out, out an electron, you just need a really intense beam of light. So this is E squared. And this is, let's plot the kinetic energy of the ejected electron, okay, here. So this wave model basically just says, you know, we can knock the, the, the higher the intensity, the more energy this, this ejected electron should have. Now, since some of you were actually already thinking about the the particle model, let's see what the particle model would actually predict. Okay, now this is the model. So this is the, this here, we talked about the, we we're talking about the wave model, which is basically newer to you. Um, but let's see what the particle model would predict. Um, so, so here we have the particle model of light. Now, what would this model predict? And some of you have actually already been thinking about it. So um, does it say that any photon, it doesn't matter what the energy of the photons is, you just need a lot of them. Or does it say that only photons with a particular energy value or higher would be able to knock um, to knock uh, an electron out. So 
as you say, and as you know from last semester, um, the uh, if you think of photons as having only a particular energy, then only photons with enough energy to overcome this this binding to, to give it enough energy to escape would actually work. Um, and uh, and so that's correct. All right. So that's so indeed the particle model predicts that. And so a graph that we might expect given this particle model might look something like this, where this is the kinetic energy of ejected electrons. And this is the photon energy. <clears throat> and we would actually see no ejected electrons at all until we got to a point where a photon had enough energy to just compensate for this, to give it enough energy to just barely escape. And then after that, So we have two different predictions. Um, we have kinetic energy of the electron versus intensity or brightness um, for the wave model. And we have kinetic energy versus photon energy uh, for the particle model. And the particle model predicts that intensity doesn't matter, right? That, that you might get more electrons coming out if you had more photons, but you're not more likely to knock one out yeah, I mean, the, the energy of a photon isn't knocked out, isn't going to increase just because you have more. You could have, you could have huge intensity with photons with this energy and absolutely nothing would happen. So this is a pretty different prediction. It's energy in one case and, in, and intensity in the other case or brightness. So what do we really see? So kinetic energy of electron. Um, it turns out that what we see is indeed a plot that looks like this. But the quantity on this axis is actually the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. So it's clear that there's a particle-like character here because there's a, there's a threshold. Um, and, but it must be that the frequency of the radiation and the photon, energy of a photon are somehow related. It's as if a photon was somehow not just a particle, but a wave too. Um, so a photon, has a frequency. <clears throat> um, it's a particle and a wave. <clears throat> and in fact, the, um, <clears throat> the energy of a photon is related to its frequency by a familiar constant, um, Planck's constant. And since frequency is related to wavelength, this is also equal to H times the speed of light over the wavelength, where this is Planck's constant, it's 6.6 it's .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. <clears throat> So at this interesting microscopic level, um, light isn't like anything that we 
that we see in the macroscopic world. And that, that actually makes some sense. I mean, there's no particular reason that the microscopic world should be just like the macroscopic world. In a certain sense, the macroscopic world is the superposition, all our experiences, the superposition of all the behavior of these tiny microscopic particles. But, um, but these particles, these, these particles of light seem to have both wave-like and particle-like character. And one way people have talked about this is as a wave packet. So a photon is like maybe like a, a little electromagnetic wave in a tiny region of space. It's got, it has absolutely has some electric and magnetic character to it, but it also is like a bullet. And in this model, intensity is just proportional to the number of photons per second striking, striking a surface. So let's see if we could actually calculate something. Um, so suppose the, so here's a, suppose the binding energy, the, the work function for a particular metal <clears throat> is three EV. In other words, you need a photon with energy three EV to knock an electron out. And the electron, when it's knocked out, has zero kinetic energy. Okay, so that's the minimum energy you have to put in. And photons with less energy than that don't do it. What's the wavelength of this photon? <clears throat> okay, well, the energy of the photon is equal to HC over the wavelength. <clears throat> So the wavelength is going to be HC over the energy. So that's going to be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by 3 EV, and we need to convert to joules, so 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per EV. <clears throat> And what we get is 4.12 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, or 412 nanometers. So nano is 10 to the minus 9, right? So this is actually visible light. Remember that, that visible light has energies from... Um, about 1.8 EV to 3.1 EV or so. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually in the violet region. So this is basically violet light. So what if the, what if the photon had four EV of energy? What if it was in the ultraviolet and it had four EV? what would happen? <clears throat> well, that, re that remaining energy um, would, would go to the kinetic energy of the electron. So the kinetic energy of the electron would be about an EV. <clears throat> so there's an interesting experiment <clears throat> that actually <clears throat> shows us both things that, that relates the, 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 the wave-like and the, the particle-like characteristics of, of photons. And it's called Compton scattering 
because a physicist named Compton did the experiment. And basically it's, it's that you shine, you shoot photons um, at stationary electrons. <clears throat> so what should happen um, is suppose a photon comes in here and here's our electron and the photon comes in with momentum P1 and energy E1 and they interact. They don't necessarily collide head on, but they interact. So we've got a photon going off this way with momentum P2 and energy E2 and we've got our electron going off this way with momentum P3 and energy three, then clearly um, the energy principle tells us that final energy has to equal initial energy. So E2 plus E3, this is the, the photon and the electron after the collision has to equal E1. So the, the photon must have must have lost energy. So the, the final energy of the photon actually has to be less than the, um, less than the initial energy of the photon. Okay, so that means that the, the frequencies should be different. So the, the final frequencies of the photon is actually going to be less than the, the initial frequency. The photon changes color. Okay, now these are actually x-rays, so color isn't really a thing for x-rays because our eyes can't do, detect x-rays. So, in fact, the, the wavelength of the photon should actually increase. <clears throat> so Compton did this experiment. He shot x-rays at graphite. So graphite is an interesting material. Um, it's it's a, it's just carbon, um, but it's it's a whole lot of benzene rings bonded to each other. So it's this big network of carbon rings, and so we have this big pi bond delocalized over the whole piece of graphite. It's it's actually it can be a conductor, but it's not a very good conductor, and so. It's reasonable in this situation to make the approximation that the electrons have negligible kinetic energy when they're they're sitting here in the graphite, because the energies the X-rays have such high energy that when they come in and hit the graphite and knock the electron off, it's it's much much higher than the the initial energy. And in fact, what Compton found was that as a result of giving some energy to the to the electron. The uh, the photon energies the photon wavelengths actually got longer, so it sort of ties the whole picture together. Now there's an interesting corollary to this. Let's go back to our two slit experiment again. <clears throat> So here's our laser, and here's our screen with two slits. But this time, what we're going to do is turn the intensity way down. So we actually, the laser actually shoots out one photon at a time. And we're going to detect this by um, putting a whole bunch of, of detectors here. They're called photomultiplier tubes. <clears throat> so detectors. <clears throat> uh, and when, when, a, when, a, when a photon hits a detector, 
it either it sends a signal to something that stores the signal and makes a click. Okay, and you can tell that it's one photon at a time because what you hear when you do this experiment is click, click, click. Okay, so we're definitely shooting out one photon at a time. <clears throat> So that's interesting because now we're 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 shooting out um, one photon at a time, and what should these detectors see? I mean, we're shooting these little bullets now, right? Instead of an intense beam. Well, what's really interesting is actually what you get is if you add up all the the clicks. <laughs> over time, one click at a time, what you actually see is a pattern that kind of looks like this. You're actually seeing interference. But since you're sending one photon at a time through these slits, it looks like a photon actually interferes with itself. So even with single photons, get interference, which means that one photon actually manages to go through both slits simultaneously. <clears throat> so photons are very interesting things. They're both particles and waves, and somehow they manage to explore all possible paths simultaneously. So both of these models actually come together in the end in a model that that gives a photon, gives light both characteristics of particles and waves. Yeah. Yeah, a photon seems to manage, an individual photon seems to manage to go through both slits at once. <clears throat> it's the only way you could get this interference pattern. <clears throat> so behavior at the, the microscopic level is a lot more interesting than one might have thought. And there's a lot of cool stuff there. <clears throat> there's um, an optional thing to read if you're interested um, that I've I put a, a PDF of a supplementary chapter on canvas and you can um, with a pointer to a particular section if you're interested in reading more about this. <clears throat> so the interference pattern shows up it's the sum okay um, so when you fire when you fire a photon, a single photon through here, one detector detects it. Yeah, there's some cool videos. You might like to look at that one. So what we're going to do on Thursday is review. And we're going to review, as I said, in the context of talking about sparks in air, and which is related to lightning and other cool things. I hope you found this at least mildly interesting. In chat. What did you think was interesting about this, if anything? 